Can I talk a little bit more about that in a second? <clears throat> so first, this issue of how experience shapes brain architecture. It's a very interesting process. What the brain does is first it overproduces connections and then it prunes them out. This is the so-called use it or lose it phenomenon, okay? So this is a schematic of what a tissue section looks like in brain at birth. You see some cells and you see the connections, the neurons and the axons and the dendrites that are connecting the cells. By six years of age, this is kind of what it looks like. It's produced a lot of these connections, but by 14 years of age, it's thinned out. It is not because you're kind of losing your marbles or because you know it's already on the downhill slide. It's because the brain, in order to work well, must prune in order to operate efficiently. If you're a business person, you will understand this in terms of the fact that you may uh, get into a lot of different lines of business and everything, but over time, you've got to strengthen the things that you're depending on, and you've got to get rid of things that are not really producing. Um, there are some forms of mental retardation where the neuropathology is overly dense connections among cells, where the brain has not been able to prune. This, is, this comes from a basic um, concept in evolutionary biology. I have to say it was in, no, it was in South Carolina, not North Carolina, where I had this experience, but I'll tell you that in a second. But from the, this is evolutionary biology. What it is is the brain in the beginning is overproducing. It's preparing itself for a wide range of environments. And then as it begins to get feedback from the environment, it starts to get rid of things that are not necessary in that environment so it can strengthen and more efficiently do what's necessary in the environment. So take language development as an example. At birth, every newborn baby um, has, is born with the capacity to speak any language in the world fluently. Okay? It's not if you're born of a certain ethnic group in a certain country that speaks a certain language, there's nothing about your brain that's any different from the brain of a child born in a different culture in a different context. They're all, all the human brains can speak any language. And in the first year of life, with all the noises that are going on around babies, the brain has this capacity. It's pretty, it's unbelievable when you think about it. It has the capacity to tell the difference between language that's being spoken around it and other environmental noises like, you know, doors slamming and cars going by and, or whatever. But the brain understands somehow, it selectively takes in language and it starts to figure out the differentiation of sounds in that language and the ability to ultimately reproduce them. So by as early as nine to 12 months of age, the part of the brain that tells the difference, subtle differences among sounds is already becoming specialized. So that, for example, now I'm not a, an expert in languages, but um, we know, for example, and, and it's kind of people some used to make fun of it, that people who speak Japanese have trouble differentiating R's from L's. Right? And if you understand anything about Chinese, it's a tonal language, so you, know, you could be reading it. If you went there and, and spoke phonetically off a page in Chinese, but you didn't get the right tone, you could end up saying something really insulting rather than complimentary because you don't really understand what you're saying because it's not just the consonants and the vowels, it's the tone. Okay? That differs from language to language. The brain figures that out just by being in a language environment. And so by a, by a year of age, it's already specializing. It's starting to prune out. It's starting to get rid of circuits that help differentiate subtle differences that are important in some language that it's never heard so it can get better in the language it's going to speak. And that's why, no matter how smart you are, um, if you learn a second language at a much older age, you'll never speak it without an accent. And why children who learn more than one language at the same time when they're younger can speak both of them as native speakers is because the brain is specialized, it's always specializing, it's always kind of getting rid of what it doesn't need so it can operate more efficiently because it's got a lot of things it has to do. And it has trillions and trillions and trillions of circuits and it doesn't need another trillion that kind of get in the way. It has to kind of be more refined. So it's a very important principle. So this issue of kind of building more connections and building more cells, that happens early, but then it has to start to thin out. It's not a matter in the brain of more is better. It's a matter of how efficient and effective is the brain going to work. So if we look at how these circuits get built over time, another important principle here is that neural circuits are built in a bottom-up sequence. First, the brain builds basic circuits for basic things. And then it builds more complex circuits on top of less complex circuits. And it's on and on over time. 
So at any point in development, whether it be a year and a half, three years of age, eight years of age, 20 years of age, <clears throat> you start a new school year, okay? New pencil case, clean notebooks, you know, kind of lunchbox, I don't know, new backpack, whatever the stuff is. And, um, you know, you're ready for a first start. But that first day, at any point in time, you're not coming in with a blank slate. You're coming in with however many years of brain circuitry you've developed up until that point. It's like the brain is always starting with what it's got. It never goes back and starts from the beginning. So what we can look at is, this is graphing the proliferation and then the pruning of synapses in different regions of the brain. So remember, don't look at something, this is for sensory pathways, for vision or hearing. It shows you that the peak of synaptic, synaptic proliferation is in the early months of the first year, and then it starts to prune. It doesn't mean the brain's going downhill. It doesn't mean that brain development peaked at the top of that curve because brain development has to also prune. So it's, you know, visually it looks like it's going down, but it has to go down in order to develop more. But the important part of this slide is that the sensory pathways develop first. The, the, the circuits for some parts of language develop second. The, 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 the synapses for higher cognitive function are kind of peaking later. They're happening, not everything's happening at the same time. They're ha happening hierarchically. They build on each other. This process, just in the first year, by before two years of age, you've had a peak of proliferation in these three areas and you're already now into the pruning phase. It's too late to proliferate more cells in these areas at this point. It's too late. It's not too late to intervene, it's not too late to remediate, it's not too late to provide good learning opportunities, but it's too late to reach the maximum amount of proliferation. So you're, if you've had really poor experiences before that, you're pruning a smaller base as opposed to pruning a really rich base. And how do these things come in? In the first couple of years of life, the brain is making 700 new synapses every second. Let's pause for that for a second. 700 synapses. 700 more synapses. 700 more synapses for a few years. If you don't believe that, just remember the brain has trillions and trillions of synapses. It's got to make them fast if it's going to get up to that point. That's not, then the number doesn't sound so staggering. But, but to understand what's going on in the brain, it's pumping out connections getting to a peak and then pruning. And the peak for some of these is like at a year of age and it's starting to prune. Is brain development over a year of age? Oh God, no, but it's in a different phase now and you can't go back. Okay. The idea about this, for those of you who have ever kind of remodeled a house or in the construction business or have anything related to that, you know that when you get into a big remodeling job, what people will tell you when they start to cost it out, at some point they say, you know, I'll tell you, it's, it costs you less money, you'll get a better house if you just tear this down. Um, because by the, when we start opening the walls, we don't know what the, the plumbing's gonna look like, we don't know what the wiring's gonna look like, and we can't even estimate what it's gonna cost, and in the end, I mean, we can fix all that, but in the end, it's probably gonna cost more money, and you're still gonna, you know, you would've been better to just rewire from the beginning. You can do that for houses, you can't do that in a human brain, you can't just like, you know, tear it down and start all over. You always have to deal with what you get at any point in time. <clears throat> Next point, cognitive, emotional, and social capacities are inextricably intertwined within the architecture of the brain. So the brain has areas of specialization. There's a little part in there called the amygdala, which is the center of circuitry for dealing with fear and threat. It <coughs> develops pretty early in life. There's the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that has the circuitry for memory, simple memory, and early learning. They're not far from each other, geographically. The prefrontal cortex comes in much later. It begins to develop early, but it doesn't mature. Actually, parts of it don't mature until adolescence and early adult life. This is kind of higher order executive functions. Um, higher order problem solving, working memory, behavioral inhibition, all of these higher order functions. The message of this, though, is that 
although you have areas of specialization, the brain is highly integrated and these areas don't operate independently of each other. You know, you can separate them in a textbook. You can have a chapter on language and a chapter on cognition and a chapter on emotional development. But in, in the brain, all these things interact, which is why emotional and social and cognitive and language all kind of affect learning. You know, you can have, you can have terrific cognitive competence, but if you're preoccupied by fears or anxious all the time, um, you're not going to learn very well. And it's because all these areas connect with each other. Now, I want to go back to this issue of how experience shapes brain architecture and tell you a little bit about what that means because this is what's nice about working with scientists. You know, scientists have no patience for platitudes and slogans. I mean, they're, they're, if nothing else, they're into being very precise and very specific, particularly about things they can measure. If you're something precisely, you can't be... You can't do any experiments. You can't be a scientist. You can't generate that kind of new knowledge. You have to measure. Okay, so what we've learned from decades of trying to understand the impact of experience on the brain is a recognition from both human studies and animal studies that the active ingredient in what we mean by experience or environment is the interaction between the immature animal or human child and the most important caregivers in that child's environment, okay? So it's not just what's out there, it's what's happening within the context of a, of a relationship and interaction. What the scientists would call uh, contingent reciprocity, uh, in order to speak to non-scientists, we use the concept of the serve and return nature of the interaction between children and the important adults in their lives. It's the fact that children do things and adults respond to what the child is doing. And the child responds to what the adult is doing. Which is why, although certainly TV can be very educational, have educational benefits for older preschoolers, TV is not a good way to educate babies. Okay? You can't put a baby in front of a, a screen and have the baby won't learn to talk from watching a screen. It's an interactive phenomenon. So what this kind of looks like, just to think of language as the foundations for literacy, is it starts out in infancy where there's, you know, it's either working or it's not, um, with a wide variation of normal and good enough, of the kind of what's a combination of vocal and then verbal and visual, back and forth interactions, reciprocal interactions between babies and the adults who care for them. And the reason we know this is important, it's built into our biology. It's very difficult to resist responding to a baby. You know, I mean, you pick a baby up in your hands and that baby coos at you or smiles. I mean, it's really hard not to respond. You'd have to work real hard to do that. That's telling us something it's, that is built into our biology. And if it weren't built into our biology, if you had to be like tutored and taught and instructed to respond to a baby, if it required that level of training, we would be extinct as a species. Because humans, of all animal species, are the most helpless for the longest period of time. You know, most animal species, within days, weeks, or months, they're up and on their way. They're out of the nest. And even, even rhesus monkeys, you know, which when you get high up in the, in the, you know, rhesus monkeys by six months of age are pretty independent. No six-month-old human is kind of off getting his own food, you know, living alone. <laughs> it's like, so it has to be built into our biology that we can't resist taking care of young children because they can't make it without us, okay? So that's, that's biology. And by the way, this is the South Carolina story. Not that I'm not making generalizations one way or the other, but I had a wonderful experience years ago um, with some people in South Carolina who were very strong believers in intelligent design who were really interested in this stuff because from their perspective, this concept that experience shapes brain circuitry is part of intelligent design, um, which is fine with me because what the sci you know, scientists say it's from evolutionary biology. If someone wants to say it's from intelligent design, it's fine with me either way. It's the reality is that experience shapes brain architecture and what for some people would be intelligent design to a scientist might be the variance left unexplained. Either way, um, we can all agree that the brain is not an automatic pilot. It doesn't just develop on its own. It's highly shaped by experience. So as kids get older, instead of just kind of cooing and smiling and gesturing back and forth, we start to kind of put labels on things and they begin to get a sense that objects have 
names, and we start to kind of create more specific language in our interactions rather than just cooing and smiling. And, and then we introduce the fact, if you think about it, it's amazing what the brain does. You know, we introduce the fact that this oral language that you experience has a representation on a piece of paper that's a function of, of curving and straight lines that represent letters. I mean, how does the brain ever figure that out? But it does because it is built to figure that out. But this is what we call experience-dependent brain development. The brain won't figure out how to learn to read if it isn't provided with books, it isn't provided with instruction. It's not, if you were in an illiterate society, at some point you wouldn't suddenly wake up and start reading. You need the experience, but the brain has the capacity to take that experience and figure out uh, written language. And then at some point, kids don't need adults to read to them anymore. They can do it on their own, but they need adults to help them write, and then at some point they don't need adults for that either, and some of them grow up and they create great literature. But the, the continuum here is that it's a serve and return process. There's nothing about this in its fundamental nature that can go on. It can be supplemented by non-human interaction, TV, videotapes, stuff like that, DVDs, but it can't be replaced. Human interaction cannot be replaced. And that's also built into biology. Here's a good one for you. There are you know, songbirds. There are lots of different species of songbirds. They each have very different songs. People who know that can tell you, you know, they can immediately identify a bird by listening to the song. How do birds learn that? They learn it from their parents. Okay. And how does that happen? Well, because they get involved early on, just like humans, in a reciprocal interaction, a serve and return. Some wonderful studies done taking baby birds, separating them, at birth, well, at hatching, from their mothers, and raising them in cages with very high fidelity recordings of the bird song for their species. They never learn to sing. They don't learn from tapes. They learn from interaction with birds who sing. It's a basic biological principle. This is real. This is not like you know a political slogan or just trying to <laughs> sell you a bill of goods. That's the other thing about the science that's really important, particularly in tough times with budget crunches. You know, we can, I mean, the science is what it is. It's always changing. What we know now is far more what we knew 20 years ago, and for sure is less than what we're going to know 20 years from now. How much we capitalize on that and try to turn that into policy and practice is up to us. But if we choose not to do anything with the science and disregard it, it doesn't mean the science isn't there. It doesn't mean everything I'm telling you isn't true. It just means we're not doing anything about it. So everything I've talked about so far has focused on what the brain needs to develop competence. It needs a kind of a, a it needs opportunities for learning. It needs experiences that are that will reinforce and help build strong circuitry. And when that's provided, the brain does real well. What I want to do now is shift to what happens to the brain when it's exposed to things that are not good for it. So this is not about you know, not enough reading, and not enough talking. This is about bad things. This is about the underlying biology of why adverse childhood experiences <clears throat> produce developmental problems and make individuals vulnerable to health problems later in life. And that gets us to another area of science that has tremendous implications for early childhood policy and early childhood development and isn't getting a lot of discussion but you know give us time we'll get it out there in the public consciousness but as I said again even though a lot of this may not be kind of a, people may not be aware of it in developing policies and deciding how to allocate limited resources but it doesn't mean this isn't true